Hello, everybody. Thanks for being here. I'm so excited for this show today. Dr. Judy and I were talking about it, and it is going to be good. So welcome to the Art of Healing with your host, Matt Rowe. <laughs> oh, my God. Can I start over, Dr. Judy? We're going to start sure? this one over. All right. Okay. Welcome to the Art of Healing with your host, Dr. Judy Jasek of Animal Healing Arts and Matt Rowe of Parsley Pet. During our show, we are talking about your pet's health, raw feeding, and the alternative treatments for cancer, unexplained illnesses, and supporting your pet's natural ability to heal. Thank you and welcome, Dr. Judy, to this week's show. Thanks, Matt. Happy to be here. And man, we're going to be talking about something that could just, uh, just gets me fired up. <laughs> That's right. You can hear the excitement in my voice. I, I end up getting a little bit too excited. And as my kids say, they're like, your eyes get really big. <laughs> so yeah. So why I'm excited about this is this is something that as a pet parent, if you have discussed raw feeding to your veterinarian, you probably have heard them tell you that, you know what, that raw feeding, that's going to kill your dog. That's terrible for your dog. You shouldn't do that. Even though we're both living proof that what your chihuahuas are 14 years old. Yeah. Yeah. Mine's 15. I got a Catahoula that's seven and I've never had a softer coat, had them be healthier and had them out of the vet without any conditions or issues at all. And we both feed raw. I'm a big proponent mm -hmm. of it. So why would a vet say this, Dr. G? Well, I guess, you know, I'm in the minority because anybody that comes to me doesn't hear that. No. But, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's misinformation propaganda is, mm. is really what it is because there is nothing, not one single definitive piece of research or even one single case that I've seen where it has been definitively proven that something in the raw food actually made a pet sick. And so we had a, a comment come through from one of our clients because she had gone in to um, a vet close to her house for an ear infection or something. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, of course she mentioned that she was feeding raw and, and she got this, got this lecture. Well, there's all that bacteria in the raw and that's going mm -hmm. to, you know, mess up your pet's microbiome. And so first of all, bacteria, like, well, what does that mean? There's bacteria mm -hmm. everywhere. Our whole world is full of bacteria and probably 98% of it's all friendly and actually beneficial. So if you're going to yeah. feed a sterilized food, a highly processed food, like a kibble diet that has all the natural anything cooked out of it, you're actually depriving your pet of the benefits of the um, of the, these beneficial bacteria that are yeah. so, Im so important for our, for our micro microbiomes. And I, and I did recently watch a, a webinar where they had done studies that showed that feeding a larger diversity of fresh foods grows a healthier microbiome in pets. Mm -hmm. So they're actually starting to study this, but to prove that a raw food or, you know, particular raw food made a pet sick. I mean, you, you would need to culture the bacteria from that raw food and then identify that that's the same bacteria in that pet that's making it sick of fecal, culture. say they have diarrhea. So you would do a fecal sure. culture and find that same bacteria. And that's never, never been done. It's like raw food is guilty mm -hmm. until proven otherwise. And they don't, most conventional vets don't mm -hmm. even try <clears throat> try to convince themselves that this may be okay. They just shut it down. Pet comes in, pet's sick, pet's eating raw food, must be the raw food that's that's making the pet sick. So let's put them on some prescription mm -hmm. diet that's completely void of nutrition. Yeah. And, and that'll that's, cr that's crazy to me because there's more proof and evidence that what is in kibble is harming our dogs than what the harm that raw food actually has. And so when we're seeing statistics that 
50% of dogs over the age of 10 are being diagnosed with cancer. And you are the one that brought this to my attention. It's actually more than that, mm -hmm. where you're seeing two thirds of dogs that are being contracting cancer, especially at younger and younger ages. And when you look at what is in kibble, kibble is toxic. It's like the equivalent of us eating McDonald's every day. It's not yeah. good for us. Yeah. And, and there's no, and there's no truth in labeling and people are always scrutinizing, well, what's in the raw food and where does, where do those ingredients come from? It's like, so most raw blends, like you and I feed Matt, they got like six or eight ingredients. You know exactly what that, you know what liver is, right? You know right. what kidney is, bone, muscle meat. I bet nobody could go read the ingredient list on a bag of kibble and know what each one of those ingredients are. I bet they couldn't mm -hmm. even pronounce most of them. I probably right. couldn't even pronounce most of them. So you're feeding your pet all of these chemicals and mm -hmm. there's no there's no real truth in labeling either. Right. They can put things in like, you know, chicken meal or, you know, something doesn't really make sense, hydrolyzed protein. What what's that? What's beet pulp? I don't know. Beets what's, have pulp. Yeah. What's ash? Yeah. When you see that on the label, I mean, you're telling me you're putting ash in the product and really it's a byproduct of ethanol. Yeah. Right. And what they do is it's very creative marketing. They sell those foods by the picture on the front mm -hmm. of the dog running through the field of flowers or whatever, or this, you know, picture of this bowl of fresh meat and vegetables, yeah. like that's what's in the food. So they get wow. you to make that association, but right. it's not true. And they know, and I think it's true. Most people are not going to read the actual ingredient list. Right. I do it all the time, all mm -hmm. the time. I bring it up on the computer for my clients. Say, look, this is what's in this food mm -hmm. that your conventional veterinarian recommended. Does that sound healthy for a mm -hmm. carnivore? And yeah. if you just use your common sense, it's it's not but it's it's just it's it's the status quo it's the standard of care and in medicine this whole like standard of care thing it's like if as long as that's what most everybody else is doing then it's okay it must be the right yeah. thing to do when mm -hmm. like they don't use their brains or think for themselves does this make any logical sense um, it's just, and it doesn't, it's just easier. It's easier yeah. to send that bag of dry food out the door that the sales rep told you is appropriate mm -hmm. for this particular condition, rather than learning a whole new way of feeding and recommending that for your patients. Right. I, I, you said it. So this whole bacteria myth, that you may, you know, they may drive on the side of you're feeding your dog bacteria, that's debunked. There, there's no proof of the bacteria in raw food that is causing these conditions or causing or may harm your dog in the long term. Yeah, no, no, there is, there's absolutely no proof. And the other thing too about dogs, so a healthy dog has a very, very, very low pH in their mm -hmm. stomach, like one to two. So yep. very low, very, very acidic. Mm -hmm. Dogs are natural scavengers. Their systems are designed so that they can go out and eat roadkill and mm -hmm. be perfectly fine. Now, I'm not recommending that you experiment with going and getting roadkill and feeding it to your dog and no. seeing if Dr. Judy's right, but that yeah. is literally what their yeah. systems are designed to handle. So mm -hmm. even if there were a little bit of contamination, a healthy dog will be able to handle that yep. just fine. The one thing I don't recommend just because there's a lot of variables is don't go to the grocery store and just buy conventional grocery store meat and feed that raw to your dog. Because right. there's been a lot of people handling that. And mm -hmm. that this has actually been been shown that the USDA allows more bacteria in those foods mm -hmm. than at the grocery store, the meat in the grocery store, than they allow in the raw food companies mm -hmm. um, because they plan on it being cooked. They assume that this meat's going to be cooked. Therefore, if there's a little bit extra bacteria, that's okay. The raw food yeah. companies are so highly scrutinized 
uh, mm -hmm. by the FDA that if anything gets cultured out of their um, food <clears throat> in their production line, um, they get shut down. They have to do recalls, um, whether it's harmful or not. So right. there's there's such a zero tolerance. They have to be so careful. The the grocery store is not so much, which is kind of ironic because that's you know what what we eat. So I don't exactly. recommend feeding that. But I'll tell you, I know people that do it, and guess what? Their dogs don't get sick. <laughs> and, but. Yeah, but you're also missing if you're just buying meat from the grocery store, you're missing key ingredients. So yeah. as my mentor taught me when I started to go through my nutritional training and how to feed a dog a proper raw diet is she said, Matt, it's really easy. Your dog, if wild, would go out in the field and kill a rabbit. Mm -hmm. It would eat that rabbit, eat the entire rabbit, bone, organ, muscle meat, brain, fur, indirectly get soil off the ground because it's not laying down place mats and just eating it on top of that. No, it's eating it off the ground. It's not sitting there and roasting it over a fire before it can eat it. It's they, don't, not, those, they don't have opposable thumbs. It's hard to strike the matches and get the fire it's going. It's super hard for them. And so they really, they want to survive. They want to be healthy. And so they eat the rabbit. So now when you buy just meat at the grocery store, it's missing bone, it's missing organ meat where it gets its iron and its magnesium. When you look at bone, it's, that's where its calcium comes in, but it needs the phosphorus from the muscle meat. So grinding that all together, giving like 10% bone, 10 to 15% bone content and 10 to 15% variety organ content, liver, spleen, brain, heart, like all of it, that really starts to complete, starts to complete that meal and what they need. Now, if you're watching this and you're like, I don't have a raw dog food supplier. We both have one, Dr. Judy and I both go to the same raw dog food company and it's actually called raw dog food company. And they do an incredible job on sourcing their product and, and putting the right blend and the right mixture together. But if you don't have it, I've had individuals I've spoken to that actually just go to their butcher and their butcher's yeah. like, yeah, I can grind up 10% <clears throat> bone in there, 15% bone. I can grind up organ in there from a variety and you just tell them what you need and they can make that happen for you. Yeah, yeah, it's not hard. I mean, people think, well, you don't have to go out and hunt rabbits for your dog. No. Um, you know, it's, and it's not, it's not hard. Um, once you know the proportions and you know, the ingredients, I do work with a lot of people out of state. Um, and that's one of the things I'll, I'll do a consult and then I'll give them a homework assignment and say, okay, I need to know what your local resources are. Do you have mm -hmm. a local butcher? Do you have natural pet food stores? Cause I don't, can't make recommendations. Um, unless I know that I have this one client that's in Kentucky and she actually found a, a local, and you know what? I'm not sure if it's actually pet food or if it's a like a human butcher shop. But anyway, mm -hmm. she can get muskrat, beaver, a like ground like whole animal. Wow. Um, yeah. So she, so she said, she said um, she was feeding her dog the 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 muskrat, singing the muskrat mm -hmm. love song from captain and, and to Neil. So she, she's got a nice sense of humor. Um, <laughs> well, that's hysterical. But, but my point is you, mm -hmm. you got to look around. Um, I'm another mm -hmm. client that she was able to find whole ground pheasant and quail yeah. and things like that. You do have, or have resources. You need to, you know, just look into what's available mm -hmm. in your particular area. And you might, you know, be surprised what you can find because these organs and the bone and you know mm -hmm. meat scraps it's gotta go somewhere you know a butcher trims these nice pretty steaks for humans to eat while well, the rest of the animal has got to go somewhere and right. probably if you went in there and said you know what if you would grind that all together i'll buy it for my dog they'd be all about it because they won't they'd love to sell this stuff because they probably throw a lot of it away yeah Amen. So now I've gone into my vet and I'm kind of in the back of my mind going, I don't know about this. What is a good conversation to have with your vet if they are approaching it from a bacteria special or that fear-based, you're going to kill your dog conversation? I would, I would start by asking them what, you know, people ask me, 
where do you get this information from? How do you know that that's the case? You know, a lot of people, yeah. they get afraid and then, then they don't, they don't ask the follow-up questions. They're like, oh my gosh, I might be killing my dog feeding raw. Mm -hmm. And they don't take a step back and say, well, so where did that information come from? Do you have right. research? Can you show me the bacterial cultures that show that mm -hmm. raw food is unhealthy for my dog? Where is that information coming, coming from? And yeah. I can guarantee you it's all propaganda or if there is any research out there, ask who is funding it because mm. it is probably from these big food corporations trying to make sure that people stay afraid of feeding something besides their food. Right. And these big food corporations that are out there, those are the ones training the veterinarians today. Yeah. In regards to nutrition, sadly, like they're receiving seven to nine hours of nutritional training and it's taught by Mars and Purina. Yeah. And you know, these big food companies that are sitting there. That's why when you go into your vet clinic, they have a big wall of kibble. Mm -hmm. Now, when you go into Dr. Judy's vet clinic and she's, I am a client of hers. Um, I <laughs> don't see a big wall of pet food. Right. Your... Cause the food's all in the freezer in the back. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> you bought it from a good supplier that actually goes, oh yes, raw, this is the way you should feed it. Now, granted that company, raw dog food company has hundreds of clients all over Colorado. And I don't see the owner of that company going, yeah, we killed another one today. No, right, it'd be I, bad for business. It'd be right? really if, bad. If you were killing your, your, um, your clients. Yeah, that wouldn't, yeah. wouldn't be good. And you know what? I, I made a, a comment in my response to this um, um, you know, comment we had from the client earlier. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, it would actually be a heck of a lot easier for me as a practitioner to just do what everybody else is doing and feed these dry foods because then yeah. I'm not going against mainstream. I don't have right. all of this explaining to do. Mm -hmm. um, it would be a heck of a lot easier, but I know yeah. it's not in the best interest of pets because if it were, why are pets getting sicker? Why are we seeing cancer rates go up? Right. Something is not right. We need to be mm -hmm. looking at doing something differently because pets are getting sicker. If this food was so great and found and uh, nutrition is the right. foundation of health, why do pets keep getting sicker? So we have to be doing something different and I've mm -hmm. seen the difference. I see pets improve all the time. Every single day I hear back from people how much better their pets are doing. They're healthier, yeah. their coats are better. They they have more energy and and we stabilize, you know, chronic mm -hmm. diseases. Um cancer patients live longer. Mm -hmm. Um we stabilize autoimmune disease. There's there's so many things we can help with. Even things like arthritis when pets get older, because these, the dry foods are very inflammatory and mm -hmm. we get them on a fresh food diet and we reduce the inflammation in the body and they feel so much better. And there's just yeah. so many benefits. And I think that's what gets me is how can a medical practitioner not be curious when you've got somebody else out there, a colleague mm -hmm. saying, Hey, I feed this way and I just see my patients improve by leaps and bounds. Isn't that what we're in this for? And, yeah. and how can you not be curious about that? Say, you know, I'd like to at least learn a little bit about mm -hmm. that. And maybe, maybe there's something to this. I used to learn a lot from my clients. I'd have clients mm -hmm. come in um, feeding raw and they'd come in to me because I was interested in it. And I'd be like, how are yeah. you feeling? Your dogs look fantastic. So what are you doing? How do you do this? So what does this look like, mm -hmm. you know, in the real world? Because before I could make specific recommendations, you know, I wanted to find out what, what people, you know, were doing. So I actually, right. you know, learned a lot from my clients. And now it's like, it's just booming my business because a lot of people are interested in a different approach. Yeah. Like we've gone down that con conventional road and it and didn't work so well. So now we, we want to do something different. What else can we do uh, to help or, help our pets? So more and more people are interested. And, the, you know, vet, I think veterinarians would find that it would actually bring people into their clinic um, mm -hmm. if they started to offer some alternatives. 
or would at least be a little bit more more open minded to what people might be coming in with instead of just prescribing them another drug they put on their counter and they have to feed it in their diet every day with that drug having side effects that come, I mean, just take a look at like inflammatory response. And if your dog is under pain, they give them gabapentin. And in there, mm -hmm. that has been known to cause cancer. Yeah. That's why they stopped giving it to human beings, but they're like, oh, let's give it to our dog community. We don't wanna, you know, not have this drug go to waste. So they're gonna really, they're gonna give it out to our dogs who they know that in the back of their mind, their lifespan is now 10, 12 years. And mm -hmm. if they get cancer, oh, they're going to get cancer at 10 to 12 years, but your dog should be living to be 15, 20 years of age. They don't have to, but this is where like, even, you know, let's put it over into the human perspective is if we eat a diet that is non-inflammatory, that means we remove glyphosate, we stop eating gluten, we stop having dairy, which our bodies can't digest, and we go down this road of eating more healthy, we feel better. We're mm -hmm. able to function a little bit more. We're able to wake up without being in pain. We don't have that inflammatory response. Our, our guts are not, we don't have irritable bowel syndrome. And so we can see it firsthand if we eat well, we feel better. So now if you go to an animal that's a carnivore and you feed a carnivore what they're meant to eat because they got these things, these big pointy teeth and their mouths move like this, they don't move side to side and they're meant to grab food and tear it apart and swallow it in chunks. And if we allow that animal to actually eat that the way they, they're supposed to be fed, they actually start to get healthier. So the example I always give is, let's take a look at wolves. I mean, your dog is a half a percent away from a wolf. And you don't see wolves in the wild sick. You don't see them like barely getting there, you know, struggle, wake, you know, walk into their prey or going to kill. Because if they did, they wouldn't survive. Right. So they know, yeah, I'm going to avoid this because this makes me sick and I'm going to lean over here because it makes me feel better. So I'm going to go kill an elk and I'm going to bring it down and I'm going to eat that elk and give it to my pack because then as a pack, we thrive, we get more, we produce more puppies, we, our pack grows and stays healthy. And that's really its goal is to get into that space. But if your dog is really closely related to that wolf, why wouldn't we feed our dogs? Yeah. And so how did wolves survive for how many hundreds or thousands of years? Hundreds of thousands. They're, yeah. They're, they're, they're not, they're not, um, you know, they're not eating kibble. They're eating this fresh meat. So how did they survive? The only thing that nearly made wolves extinct was humans killing them. Yeah. Uh, it, it wasn't kibble deficiency in their, in their diet, right? So yeah, how right. would they be able to thrive and, and reproduce um, by, by eating this way, by eating the, you know, killing prey and mm -hmm. eating the, the raw meat, if, if it wasn't, if it wasn't healthy for them, if it wasn't in their best evolutionary, you yeah. know, advantage. And yeah, even though my little trial is five pounds, little hard to believe, She's that closely related to a wolf, but you know, genetically they are. Yep. And I don't see um, your chihuahuas pulling down an elk anytime soon. Not even a pack um, of three of them. No, it's though CJ work. was trying to attack the geese last night on our walk, <laughs> you know, and they're about five or six times her size, but they'd come, we were walking in a park, you know, and there was the Canadian right. geese just kind of hanging out. And she'd yeah. be like, she was on, on leash, but you know, she'd be like charging them with her hackles up. Like you stay away, you know, I'm protecting mom, you know, I am going to get you a goose almost ate chihuahua that night for dinner. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I know I was a little worried. Like if one of these actually did approach, uh, I don't know who's going down me or the dogs, but I'm pretty sure she's right. not going to protect me at that point. <laughs> I think Dr. Judy to have a story today being like, yeah, I was bit by a goose. I was protecting my dog. Yeah. yeah. 
So I want to thank you guys so much for watching the show. Know that if you do get pushback on feeding raw from your veterinarian, there are things you can do. Ask for research, ask for data, ask for information from them, have them prove it to you. And if they can prove it to you, look at the source. Where did this information come from? And make sure you're not following that money thread. It's not coming from the big companies that are mm -hmm. falsifying this data or putting or twisting the data to go to their perspective is really taking a look at is what is best for my dog and yeah. how do I help them be thrive in their lives? So, yeah, absolutely. And ask questions, be an mm -hmm. advocate, you know, for your pets. It's so much harder now with the curbside drop-offs and everything, but mm -hmm. you know, you can still ask, they make recommendations and say, wh where, where are you getting your information from? Push a little bit you know, ask yeah. them, they should have, they should be able to provide you with resources if they're, if they're making strong statements like that, mm -hmm. they should be able to, to give you the information or give you the, the source of their information. So ask, ask questions. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Judy, for this awesome show today. All right. So thank, thank you, Matt. All right. We'll see you guys later and uh, come join us next Wednesday, 12 o'clock over your lunch hour. We'll talk soon and we'll see you guys all later.